Newark Baptist Church, and welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, in Jesus' name, we pray tonight, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would guide us into all truth. Amen. Okay, so this is lesson seven of our series, Understanding the Jews. And last week, we finished up a look at the biblical event concerning Sodom and Gomorrah, and most importantly, of course, the theological impressions that it left on the Jews. And now this week, I want to move on uh, to another central event in the Old Testament book that we call Genesis, and that is the binding of Isaac. And I'm not saying the sacrifice of Isaac because he was not literally sacrificed, although you can make the argument that spiritually he was. So the binding of Isaac. Now this event has just huge importance for both the Jew and the Christian. We both see it as a seminal moment in the history of man and what God wants man to learn from it. There is one sense that our understanding and that of the Jews is, is pretty much the same. Uh, but at the highest level, it could not be more different. So let's begin by looking at a passage in Genesis chapter 22 and verses 1 through 3. And the scripture reads, And it came to pass after these things, that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Genesis 22, 1 through 3. Now, we just finished up studying about the interaction between God and Abraham before the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And now we just read about Abraham and God's interaction before Abraham set out for Mount Moriah to sacrifice his son, Isaac. Question, is there anything that jumps out to you when comparing these two events? There definitely is. When God told Abraham that he was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham objected, and he tried to negotiate with God over his intention to do that. But here, when God tells Abraham to offer up his only son, the son that he loved, we do not see Abraham raising any objection at all. There is no negotiation. There's only compliance. Why do you think that was? Well, perhaps the incident at Sodom gave Abraham more respect for God's wisdom versus his own. And now he has been more sure that God actually knows what he's doing. This is one of the great mysteries of Abraham's life. Nobody knows for sure exactly why he acted the way he did, why he gave no challenge. What we do know is that the sacrifice of human beings to appease all manner of gods small g, for all manner of reasons, was indeed an all-too-common practice. 
And it's speculated that at that point in time, Abraham was not aware that it was wrong. In fact, the staying of Abraham's hand by God uh, in this Genesis account represents the first known objection to the practice in any literature, be it biblical or otherwise. So we know that Abraham did not sacrifice Isaac. But the belief of many Jews is that his willingness to do so and the closeness of the act itself had lasting effects on both Isaac and Sarah. What did Sarah think? Was she consulted about this ahead of time? Was she even aware of any of this uh, before Abraham returned and she heard the story about what had happened? The Bible is silent as to what Sarah knew and when she knew it. But the Bible does provide some information that gives rise to the notion that this incident with her son Isaac caused a problem between Abraham and her. And that information leads many Jews to believe that Sarah was very unhappy about what Abraham had done. And from that moment on, Sarah decided that she was going to live apart from Abraham. And then soon after that, she died. Let's look at the scriptures in Genesis twenty-two nineteen. 19. The scripture reads, So Abraham returned unto his young men, and they rose up and went together to Beersheba. And Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. So this verse is immediately after the binding and near sacrifice of Isaac. And we're told here that Abraham dwelt in Beersheba. Well, Beersheba is in the land of the Philistines. And just a few verses later, we're told that Sarah actually died. Let's look at Genesis 23, verses 1 through 2, where the scripture reads, And Sarah was an hundred and seven and twenty years old. These were the years of the life of Sarah. And Sarah died in Kirjath Arba. The same is Hebron in the land of Canaan. And Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. So where was she living when she died? In Hebron, which is in Canaan. She wasn't living with Abraham. And because this is mentioned on the heels of Isaac's binding, it is thought by the Jews that Sarah was livid about what Abraham had done. And as a consequence, she chose to live apart from him. And even further, that the stress of this event hastened her death. Is that the way it happened? We cannot know for sure. But the sequence of events and what we are told is quite suggestive. But in the end, there are, there are two truths that can be derived from Abraham's actions here. First, number one, Abraham was commended for his willingness to offer back to God that which was most precious to him. He would hold back nothing from his God. And two, Abraham's willingness was sufficient. And God made clear that he did not want human sacrifice. 
In fact, we see in Scripture that God forbade it. And for that, I want to turn to Leviticus 18. Two verses here, 21 and then down to 24. Verse 21 reads, And thou shalt not let any of thy seed, meaning your children, any of thy seed pass through the fire to Moloch. Moloch's a false god. Fire is a reference to the form of death. Neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God. I am the Lord. And then down in verse 24, the scripture reads, Defile not ye yourselves in any of these things. For in all these the nations are defiled, which I cast out before you. So we see that human sacrifice was practiced in the nations surrounding the Jews. And here, in these scriptures, we see God forbade the Jews to do what they were doing. In fact, we see that prohibition against human sacrifice becoming part of the Mosaic Law. And now I want to go to Deuteronomy for that. And we're talking about Deuteronomy 18 and verses 9 and 10. The scripture reads, When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you any one that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch. So, this whole series of study uh, that we're now going through about understanding the Jews, at this point we're at a crucial spot, I think, in how the Jews reacted to Jesus when he began talking about sacrificing himself. To the Jew, this was forbidden. It was against their law. And in addition to that, the way in which Jesus said that he would be sacrificed was also unacceptable. To be crucified on a wooden cross. And now I want to go all the way up to the New Testament to read a verse in Galatians. And we're looking at Galatians 3.13. The scripture reads, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. Now, of course, the sacrifice of an ordinary man could not cover sin. But Jesus was not an ordinary man. He was not just a man. He was the God-man. And the sacrifice of the God-man could and did cover sin. But because the Jews could not accept Jesus as God, they could not accept his sacrifice. Only by hearing and accepting the gospel could they see the truth about this. And what is the gospel? The death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. The gospel is referred to as what? The good news. By definition, it is a revelation from God, and it was new. The Jews could not accept this new truth, and instead they held on to their law, they held on to their traditions. And so when it comes to the kingdom, the first, the Jews, became last. And the last, the church, became first. The oracles of God did come to the Jews first, but lastly, it came to the church. 
and only the church received it. And so the church will be the first to enter the kingdom. The Jews will eventually come, praise God, but they will be last. So the account of Isaac's binding is both a lesson in faith and obedience, as well as it is a lesson that underscores the passage in Romans 12, 1, which you're all familiar with, where we learn that God does not want dead sacrifices. He wants living sacrifices. So, next in line of the patriarchs that I want to address is Isaac's son, Jacob. And I want to focus specifically on the deception of Jacob. Most all of us are familiar with this episode in the life of Jacob. It's one that's filled with duplicity and deception, stress, anger, uh, and lasting animosity. Abraham's son Isaac is getting near to the end of his life. And it's time for him to bestow the greatest blessing on the one who will take his place as the new patriarch of the family. And let's look at that in Genesis 27. And I want to read the first four verses here. The scripture reads, And it came to pass that when Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called Esau his eldest son, and said unto him, My son. And he said unto him, Behold, here am I. And he said, Behold now, I am old, I know not the day of my death. Now therefore take, I pray thee, thy weapons, <clears throat> thy quiver, and thy bow, and go out to the field, and take me some venison and make me savory meat such as I love, and bring it to me that I may eat, that my soul may bless thee before I die. Genesis 27, 1 through 4. So clearly, it was Isaac's intention to bestow that blessing, the one that is reserved for his successor, to Esau, Isaac's firstborn. It's also clear that Isaac loved Esau and that he actually had a personal preference for him over Jacob. Let's look at Genesis 25. Beginning with verse 27, the scripture reads, And the boys grew, and Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field. And Jacob was a plain man, dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau, because he did eat of his venison. But Rebekah loved Jacob. Genesis 25, 27 through 28. So seeing that the time was at hand for Isaac to bestow the blessing on his successor, Isaac's wife, Rebekah, hatched a plan to trick Isaac into giving that blessing to his younger son Jacob instead. Now let's go to Genesis 27, 5. And down through verse 8. So beginning with 5. And Rebekah heard when Isaac spake to Esau his son. And Esau went to the field to hunt for venison and to bring it. And Rebekah spoke unto Jacob, her son, saying, Behold, I heard thy father speak unto Esau, thy brother, saying, Bring me venison, and make me savory meat, that I may eat and bless thee before the Lord before my death. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice according to that which I command thee. Uh, now, I'm not going to read the whole account due to its length, uh, but suffice it to say 
uh, that Rebecca's plan was successful and Jacob ended up stealing his brother's blessing. The key verse is found in Genesis 27, 29. The scripture reads here, let people serve thee and nations bow down to thee. Be Lord over thy brethren and let thy mother's sons bow down to thee. Cursed be every one that curseth thee, and blessed be he that blesseth thee. So the deed was done. And by the time Esau returned from the field with his venison for his dad, it was too late for him to receive the primary blessing. He got a blessing, but not this one. And when he realized what had happened, he hated his brother Jacob to the point that after his father Jacob died, or his father Isaac died, he was planning to kill Jacob. 2741 will tell us that. The scripture reads, And Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, The days of mourning for my father are at hand. Then will I slay my brother Jacob. So this is quite a dramatic episode in the life of Jacob. And what are we to make of it? Rebecca's given credit for recognizing what Isaac failed to see. Namely, that Jacob was the one who was better equipped to carry on the faith and practice of the family. And she was right. We have some proof of that back in Genesis 26. And we're going to look at two verses, 34 and 35. The scripture reads, And Esau was 40 years old when he took to wife Judith, the daughter of Beeri, the Hittite, and Bashamoth, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite, which were a grief of mind unto Isaac and to Rebekah. Genesis 26, 34 and 35. So Esau took him wives from the Hittites. And he wasn't supposed to do that. And it grieved his parents. And when it was time for Jacob to marry, Isaac and Rebekah sent him away from the land of Canaan back to the land of Abraham to get a wife. And for that, we find scriptures in Genesis 27, beginning with Genesis 27, 46. I'm going to write, write, go right over to the next chapter, a couple of verses to 28, 2. But beginning in 27, 46, the scripture reads, And Rebekah said to Isaac, I am weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth. Now, these are the daughters that, unfortunately, Esau took himself as wives. So he was still upset about this. If Jacob takes a wife of the daughters of Heth, such as these which are of the daughters of the land, what good shall my life do me? And Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said unto him, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. Arise, go to Paden Aram, to the house of Bethuel, thy mother's father, and take thee a wife from thence of the daughters of Laban, thy mother's brother. Genesis 26, 46 through Genesis 28, 2. And so we see that Laban was Jacob's uncle. So there are valid reasons as to why it was proper for Jacob to lead the family instead of Esau. First, by the scriptures that we read, it's evident that Esau did not have good judgment. Certainly not in his choice of wives. He was not supposed to take a wife 
from among the Canaanites, and he did. Second, he did not have proper respect for, nor the importance of his birthright as the first son in the first place. Let's look at Genesis 25 to prove that out. And we're going to read 29 through 34. The scripture reads, And Jacob sawed pottage, and Esau came from the field, and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. And Esau said, Behold, I am at the point to die, and what profit shall this birthright do to me? And Jacob said, Swear to me this day. And he, Esau, swear unto him. And he sold his birthright unto Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils. And he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised or disrespected his birthright. Genesis 25, 29 through 34. So, according to this, Esau was no longer entitled to his birthright because he had already sold it. He had only himself to blame. And three, most importantly and above all else, it was God himself who decreed that it would be Jacob to carry on after Isaac. Let's turn to Genesis 25, 23. The scripture reads, And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people. And the, listen, the elder shall serve the younger. Genesis 25 23. The elder Esau shall serve the younger, Jacob. So it was God's will for this matter of succession to turn out the way that it did. So we could say, well, all's well that ends well. But it's not that simple. There is an uneasiness among the Jews that Jacob's lies and deceptions are not a good example to follow. Should we teach our children that it's okay uh, to lie to their father or to be deceitful? Uh, I think not. I have a memory that perhaps some of you may remember too. There was an old program on the radio that used to be hosted by a preacher by the name of Bob Jones Sr. I know that Jones had some serious flaws. I'm not denying that. I know he was a devout segregationist unto the end, and he was even a key player to split between fundamentalism and evangelicalism. Uh, but at one time before the split, he was actually a father figure to Billy Graham. But Graham took the evangelical road and Jones remained a fundamentalist. But that's not what I'm here to talk about. Uh, regardless of where you come down on Jones' ministry, it cannot be said that all of his preaching was devoid of truth. And he certainly had a lot of listeners to his radio broadcasts. But Jones had a saying that he used to repeat from time to time when he was on the air. And that saying stuck with me over the years. And I remember it to this day. He used to say, it's never right to do wrong to do right. It's never right to do wrong to do right. I wish he followed his own advice. But, that, but what we're talking about here, that's another way of saying that the ends don't justify the means. And it seems that this is the issue that the Jews have with Jacob. 
And I think we too, as Christians, have some of that same uneasiness when it comes to the tactics of Jacob. Is God saying that it's all right or was all right for Jacob and Rebecca to do wrong, to do right? Uh, the outcome concerning who should receive the blessing was clearly within God's will. But what about the means? What about how they went about it? I think that any fair examination of Jacob's life after this incident will show that God was not pleased with how Jacob went about accomplishing his task. God's way would have included honesty and integrity. I believe that Jacob got what was rightfully his, but he did it in his own way, not God's way. In Galatians 6, 7, the scripture reads, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, what? That shall he also reap. What did Jacob sow? He sowed the sin of deception. And what did he reap? Well, immediately he reaped the fruit of deception. First of all, he reaped his father's hurt and his father's disappointment in him. And he reaped his brother's anger and hatred. And on the heels of that, he reaped deception itself on himself. After Esau threatened to kill Jacob, Jacob fled to his uncle Laban in Syria, uh, where, of course, he fell in love with Rachel. And guess who got deceived? You know what happened. Laban deceived Jacob into marrying Rachel's sister Leah before he could marry Rachel. And it didn't end there. <clears throat> Just as Jacob had deceived his father, so too did Jacob's own sons deceive him. And they did it in the worst possible way. They actually told Jacob that the son that he dearly loved, Joseph, was not only dead, but that he had been torn apart by wild beasts. And it was totally a deception. It was a total lie. And they told this to Jacob, knowing full well that it was going to be devastating to him and he would have great pain and suffering over it and yet they did it. So what do we take from all of this? It seems there are a number of lessons here. First and above all, God's will is going to be done. Amen. That's number one. Two, it does make a difference how we go about carrying out his will. There's no indication in the Bible account that either Rebecca or Jacob sought out the wisdom of God as to how the matter could have been properly dealt with. This scheme that they worked out was out of their own imagination and they paid a price for that. And three, there is a price to pay for doing things on our own without seeking God's wisdom. Specifically, for doing something wrong to achieve something. So, staying with our brother Jacob, we need to spend just a moment to consider his taking on a new name. And, Lord willing, when we meet again next week, we're going to take that up. But please remember, pray for those on our prayer list. Until next week, Shalom.